Yeah, so I sh would like to thank again for the organizers. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I <laughs> this is probably eighth or ninth trip for me to come to Brazil. We collaborate uh, with uh, Elisa Saitovic, and uh, that was uh, very much of uh, uh, you know, thanks to this collaboration, I could come to this country for so many times. Okay, so today I'd like to talk about the uh, super free density uh, story. And, uh, okay. So, uh, the data I will show you is a product of uh, collaboration with many, many people in various years. I just show you one of uh, the f pictures taken uh, with my collaborations. Uh, this person is Graham Rook from McMaster University. Uh, he's my major collaborator for doing muon spin relaxation experiment. Uh, and we usually go to Vancouver facility in the summer and do the experiment with uh, like 10 or 15 people. And uh, here we are seeing uh, Travis Williams, who is sitting there. Uh, this time he didn't have much of beard, <laughs> so he looked differently. But uh, this is myself. Uh, there's a, this person is from Erisa's group, and uh, some people from Japan. And this is so major collaboration, and uh, it's always enjoyable to work with various people from various countries. So today I'd like to start with the uh, super free density and Bose-Einstein BCS crossover. So uh, we already heard about BCS theory, <coughs> but uh, as you know, BCS theory electron comes, and uh, its passage would uh, distort the lattice so phonon is mediated, but the phonon is slow, and so he is waiting for the second electron, and then this uh, distortion would allow the second electrons to gain energy, and this is the origin of the attractive interaction. So the <laughs> important feature of this theory is that uh, this is assuming that electrons are much, much faster than the lattice motion. The other way of saying is that Fermi energy, the electron energy scale or time scale, is much, much larger than the uh, lattice vibration time scale or energy scale, which is uh, represented by the Debye frequency. This is called uh, retarded interaction, and uh, also there are various uh, features like weak coupling and so on. Uh, today, I'd like to try to show you that many of the new superconductors do not satisfy this relationship. But uh, we should start from this old relationship, which is retarded. And this is a very important feature of BCS theory. OK, so the other thing we also have already today is that uh, in the BCS uh, <coughs> theory, superconductivity means that the formation of energy gap around the firm surface. And uh, the energy gap strength is proportional to the Debye frequency. Sometimes we call this as a mediating boson frequency. And uh, you have Tc, which is determined by this uh, energy gap. Energy gap and Tc is proportional to each other. So Tc is scaling with uh, Debye frequency in this case. But uh, the important thing also I wish to stress is that in the BCS superconductor, Tc does not depend too much on the carrier population. The carrier operation I mean is this uh, entire volume of Fermi sphere. And uh, uh, this can be measured by, for example, <laughs> studying superfluid uh, or superfluid population, as I will show you soon. But anyway, so th this is entire Fermi sphere is gapped in the BCS theory whenever gap is formed. So suppose you hypothetically have a very similar material, but the Debye frequency is half. Then your gap size is half, and Tc would be half, like this. But even for this red, so, so very low Tc, half a Tc superconductor, all the carriers, all these blue ones, would participate in superfluid or supercurrent. And therefore, in that sense, Tc does not depend on the carrier population in the case of BCS theory. This is another thing I will show you that would not be happening in many of the new superconductors. So our experimental method is called muon spin relaxation. 
And uh, unfortunately, with one hour talk, I do not have time to explain details of the techniques. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to, s to look at some other literature. But we have muon spin, and the precession of the muon spin as a function of time in the material can be recorded by its decay, radioactive decay. And what we are showing here is that uh, in the potassium 3C60 superconductor, buckyball superconductor, we implanted muons and uh, measured by applying external magnetic field, muon spin would precess around this external field. And uh, we are seeing its precession pattern and how much spin polarization is remaining or decaying. So in the normal state, this upper figure is normal state. There's no reduction of the precession amplitude you are seeing here. And this is simply because if you apply two kilogauss of the external field, all the different muons, muons that, as I will show you, injected one by one, but all those different muons are fearing the same field of two kilogauss. <laughs> However, in the case of a uh, uh, in the case of a superconducting phase, at 3.3 Kelvin, you see that uh, this muon spin, spin oscillation is damped very quickly. And uh, this damping gives us much of the information related to superconductivity. So we fit, we call this, or we fit this with uh, this Gaussian envelope, and uh, which defines this uh, muon spin relaxation rate, sigma. This sigma is simply the damping rate that the uh, muon spin is doing in this precession. So damping means that the field, internal field, becomes somehow inhomogeneous. And uh, the reason is the following. If you apply two kilogauss of this external field to a type two superconductor, such as this buckyball or cuplet superconductors, the external field would penetrate into the system by forming this flux vortex lattice or abricoso lattice. And uh, so the uh, vortex core is actually becomes normal. So this is a way that superconductor compromises to introduce magnetic field. However, between those vortex cores, the superconductivity is remaining in a sense that it would still like to expel the external field. And uh, so Meissner effect tracing is taking place. And therefore, the magnetic field inside superconductor is smaller than that of the core field. And uh, this decay in real space is parametered or is following the length scale parameter called magnetic field penetration depth. And uh, also, if you apply about two kilogauss, for example, this adjacent vortex core has a distance of about 1,000 angstroms. So this is a kind of mesoscopic structure. And uh, what happens for mu SR is that uh, we implant one muon. So this first muon may stop here, and he will process, uh, he, he will feel this extent, this field, and process with this field. And uh, then at some time within his lifetime, he will decay. <coughs> and uh, essentially, he will tear us this field. The second muon might stop in a different position, happen to be here. Then his frequency is somehow smaller. The third muon might stop near the core, and his frequency may be larger. So our experiment, we collect something like one million or more muons. So this is meaning that uh, all these muons would precess, but uh, the damping is reflecting this uh, inhomogeneity of the field. This is a dephasing of sinusoidal oscillation. And uh, OK, therefore, we measured this damping rate or relaxation rate, sigma. But because of this, that parameter is determined by the inhomogeneity of the field. And uh, it is known that this inhomogeneity of the field is inversely proportional to this penetration depth, the length scale that field changes in the material. Now, this 1 over lambda square can be calculated by using London equation. And it is known to be determined by this formula. But most impo importantly, this NS is the number of superconducting carriers. So this is superconducting carrier density. M star is the effective mass. The other things are constant. 
And uh, this parameter, coherence length divided by the mean free pass, in our most of the superconductors that I mentioned today has very short coherence rings and can be made to be reasonably clean, so with large mean free pass. So we can at least have a sample where we don't have to be worried about this parameter. Essentially, so we just have to look at this area <laughs> parameter. And uh, so that means that uh, if you measure the damping rate, we are measuring the inverse of the penetration depth square, and that is essentially a factor which shows what is the number density of superconducting carriers divided by the effective mass you have in a given superconductor at a given temperature. So this NS over M star, <laughs> we conventionally call this as superfluid density, although it's divided by the mass. So uh, let me just use that wording. This is what we call superfluid density. And the why we have this here can be understood very simply. So this, this effect is due to the supercurrent trying to shield external field. Okay. So <laughs> you will remember that conductivity, ohmic conductivity of a given metal is determined by carrier density of the normal state charge divided by the mass or effective mass multiplied by the scattering time tau. That is ohmic conductivity. In this case, tau, there's no scattering. It's a supercurrent. But essentially, by the effect of this uh, muon relaxation, what we are measuring is supercurrent density. And that's why we have this NS over M star. And that's why we can measure this superfluid density. OK. So <laughs> within about two years of the uh, discovery of high TC cuprate superconductors, we performed this measurement in uh, various different ITC cuprate superconductors. And uh, what we are plotting here is uh, these are different materials with different doping rates. And uh, what we are plotting here is TC on the vertical axis and this uh, muon spin relaxation rate sigma, or this essentially this is a uh, superfluid density, carrier density divided by the mass in the horizontal axis. And uh, so what we're seeing here, this is the uh, 214 series that Bednold's mirrors superconductor. And uh, with different doping, initially TC is lower. You can increase TC. You come to something called optimal region. And then you can dope even more to come to this overdoped region, where I hope to come back soon today. So more pronounced, uh, easier thing can be seen in this one, two, three, the most famous yttrium barium couplers oxide superconductor. In the so-called amda doped region, you dope carriers. And initially, carrier density is lower, TC is lower, and then TC is increasing with increasing carrier density. And again, it comes to the so-called optimal region, and then something else happens in the overdoped region. Similar thing can be happening in the triple layer super <coughs> high TC cuprate superconductor. So anyway, what you're seeing here is the feature that TC is extremely strongly related to the density of carriers, essentially this carrier number. And uh, so in my opinion, this is the one of the first clear signature that these cuprates seem to be different from BCS superconductors. Remember, BCS superconductors, TC and this Fermi volume is completely unrelated, nearly unrelated. But in this case, you are seeing that this TC and the number of carriers of this, all this superfluid density is very explicitly and very strongly related with each other. OK. So uh, of course, we tried afterwards to add data on many different but similar unconventional superconductors. and. Uh, these are the points from alkali doped potassium C60, so-called buckyball superconductors. Again, it comes about the same kind of relationship. But more strikingly, you can see that uh, this new ion arsenide superconductors, if you just take data of these systems or even more different systems, many of those samples would have points parallel to, nearly parallel to this situation. So uh, 
this seems to be kind of interesting. There is some universal feature that TC may be related to this number density or superfluid density NS over M star. And uh, I would like to uh, guide you to how we can enjoy this experimental result. Yes. Excuse me, I can't. Is there a fact? Uh, I wonder, is there a sort of linear relationship between the ends of S and the, uh, the doping concentration, which? which oh, oh if, yeah, in, the, in many cases, this NS is following the uh, chemically doped concentration. But of course, it could depend on effective mass as well. And in some of the, the uh, uh, recent works of iron arsenide, for example, uh, by Shibauchi and Matsuda, uh, they are claiming that their result, Msta is making more important role or very important role. And for the given same carrier density, just by if you can change Msta, then uh, the superfluid density could change. But in the cuprates, it's just like a how many holes you have, in, especially in the underdog side. So this is rather simple. Okay. So a uh, simple-minded way to enjoy this result is the following. Uh, firstly, we are measuring NS over M star. And so suppose you know M star from some other experimental <laughs> cell. Usually M star of those cuprates about two or three times the bare electron mass. Anyway, so. If you know that, you can calculate how many carrier density you have per square or cubic centimeter or square centimeter or something. And uh, in the, for example, in the case of BCS superconductor, you have so many different, so many carriers overlapping with each other. So uh, you can compare with another length scale co called coherence length and cal calculate how many pairs you have per coherence length region. And in the case of BCS, coherence length is 2,000 angstrom or something, and so, so uh, more. And so you will have many, many carriers overlapping. In the opposite picture could work for the uh, superfluid helium. And uh, that is uh, kind of representative of known case for Bose-Einstein condensation. But this helium, you have uh, approximately one boson touching with each other. So essentially, each boson is barely touching with each other. So one boson per coherence length square region. So in the case of cuprates, if you can estimate coherence length from HC2, as was discussed this morning, then uh, we can calculate how many carriers are overlapping. And interestingly, all, most of those superconductors riding on this line have about several carriers or several pairs, maybe three or four pairs overlapping with each other. So this is a situation of so new unconventional superconductors. And as just by looking at this, you can see that it is impressively close to the situation of this superfluid helium. But somewhere in between this BCS situation and this Bose-Einstein condensation or, or independent boson situation. So we can try to make things a little bit more quanti quantitative. For, Do you know the relation for heavy fermions? Yes, I will show you soon. <laughs> so wait. So uh, uh, for uh, so you know, I was showing this uh, n over m star, but I hope you to remind that n over m star can be converted into or has a meaning of energy. This can be most easily appreciated if you remember that two-dimensional Fermi gas, Fermi temperature non-interacting Fermi gas, Fermi temperature is just determined by sheet density, carrier density divided by the mass. So we can derive that quantity very easily because what we are measuring is three-dimensional current density. But if you know the interlayer spacing, then you can just calculate how many you know, sheet carrier density you have. And therefore, you can convert our horizontal axis into this energy scale, Kb, Tf. This is a sort of effective Tf, not a real Tf. This is superfluid-like TF, 
or what I would like to call charge energy scale of super free. And uh, if you like, you can call this as Drude energy scale. But anyway, this is a kind of energy scale of the charge screening this external magnetic field. So we also have three-dimensional systems. So for three-dimensional systems, if we have to try to do the same thing, you have to remember that Fermi energy has a different proportionality to the N and S, M star, and the effective <laughs> n to the two-thirds divided by the effective mass. <coughs> so you need one more parameter. Usually, you can use this uh, Zomafert constant or Pauli susceptibility, which is proportional to the density state of the Fermi surface. And then uh, you can, again, calculate from this superfluid density and the one other parameter, you can calculate this Fermi energy. But as you can see from this power, much of the number effect is coming from superfluid density. And the other parameter is giving not too much of the, of the contribution. Factor of 10 different <coughs> zone mapper constant would result in, because of the quota power, only 50% correction of the number. Anyway, so we can do this simple calculation and uh, make, or <laughs> make the pro to have more explicit energy scale in the horizontal axis. So this is that plot. Here I plotted TC versus Fermi energy or effective energy or Drude energy thus derived from this superfluid density in the horizontal axis. And uh, okay, so these are cuprets, these are buckyballs, these are heavy fermions. You see, these these are points from heavy fermion superconductors, and these are mostly all mostly from our own measurements. We can also make other point of conventional superconductors like zinc or aluminum tin. Niobium. These things are known to have very high Fermi temperature, but low TC, like 2 Kelvin or 3 Kelvin for aluminum and tin and so on. So anyway, so <laughs> as compared to this so-called, <laughs> this is a BCS, like simple metallic superconductor, you can see that new superconductors have very high TC with respect to this charge energy scale, Gf. You can see this. I will show you. Some. <laughs> 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 I looked at this here, <laughs> or we can put more and more. Uh, but I am Arsenal is representative one. I, I put here. <laughs> oh, uh, the uh, if we if we view these as a two-dimensional system, then we just by knowing the interior spacing, we can calculate. Two-dimensional TF, okay. and for three, but we can do also another thing. Like for we can try to treat this as three-dimensional system, and then you can combine the number of superfluid density with the number of <laughs> zone constant or something, and those two operations would give us not too much different number, and so that's why I put it this way. Oh, yeah, yeah. So oh, so I'll come to that point later. But these are not real Fermi temperature if you, you, know, you write from the lowest end of the band. For example, heavy fermions, you have this uh, very light carrier and then heavy carrier in the near Fermi surface. So real Fermi energy is rather large. But uh, this way, what you would measure is effective Fermi energy, which is just how <laughs> easily the carriers would be mo moving and how many carriers you effectively have to shield the external magnetic field. Okay. And therefore, the number you derive this way is usually smaller than what you would get from the real Fermi temperature. For example, in the cuprets, you are seeing that uh, it's something like uh, 2,000 <coughs> Kelvin. But uh, you know, if you really <coughs> have Fermi do Alpes and so on and, and get from lower end of the band, you will have probably higher energy. OK, so uh, but the next thing you can do is since we are calculating the number density and the mass of the carrier, then uh, suppose you can do hypothetical calculation. Suppose you have such and such number of carriers and mass. Then uh, if each of those fermions would make the uh, uh, 
tightly bound bosons, what would be the Bose condensation temperature? So this is a limit of Bose gas, uninteracting Bose gas. And then that limit is shown by this dotted line <coughs> CP. So the, uh, this idealized, uh, compared to this idealized Bose gas transition temperature, the linear material have TC of about factor of four or five reduced. Okay, still high TC, but it's not yet coming to the, this ideal limit of Bose gas. Okay. <laughs> so this ideal limit you can check by putting the corresponding number for helium, superfluid helium-4. That has Bose condensation at 2.2 Kelvin. And uh, in the case of helium-4, your number of density and mass you can easily calculate. And if you put that, you know, the ideal Bose gas temperature is, condensation temperature is 3.2 Kelvin. The air helium-4 helium lambda point is 2.2. So it's slightly reduced, but not factor of four. And so helium-4 comes near this idealized, right? You can also plot, try to plot the case for the uh, cold atom Bose-Einstein to BCS crossover. Nowadays, cold atoms can be doing this. And uh, however, cold atoms, the density or the effective Fermi temperature is very, very small. And uh, also, the transition temperature is very, very small. So uh, it cannot come to this plot. So I have to multiply both axes by factor of 10 to the 8. But if you do that, then at least you can check the ratio. And the ratio is actually agreeing with this simple calculation of this ideal Bose gas condensation. It's again slightly towards fermionic or BCS side, but uh, it's very close to this ideal Bose gas. That's what's happening in the cold atom. Okay, so this is a B Bose Einstein condensation limit. And I will try to come to, to the, my own explanation of why these real superconductors are not yet coming to this Bose Einstein condensation temperature. But hopefully, this is showing that this linear relationship I showed you is actually reflected in this linear line here. And uh, it is somehow suggesting us again to view all these materials in the crossover from Bose-Einstein to BCF or the, you know, the uh, <laughs> condensation. The real material is somehow in between. But uh, as you can see again, it's kind of impressively close to the Bose-Einstein condensation side. So this is promoting us to think all the old area of old theorists and probably people of the age above 60 or 70, they never even tried to think Bose-Einstein condensation because it was defeated when the <laughs> BCS was successful. But uh, this is more as promoting us again to think possible importance of Bose-Einstein condensation and possible relevance to this crossover. Yes? Well, I have, I have a question. Uh, if you were to look at these systems from the point of view of entropy and condensation, is this saying that in some sense the amount of entropy and condensation is the same for all of these systems? If after all, TC over TF is a fixed. Uh, was could one also regard this as a constancy of entropy of condensation? After um, all, TC over TF is a determiner, determines the amount of entropy of condensation. Uh, I haven't thought that way, so I, I do not have prepared answer for that. I will have to learn <laughs> more about that. But, uh, but if we assume that you're saying th this is just simply giving that message as well. But you, you see that it's not, not all these superconductors have same ratio. Right, you can see that there is an upper limit in the ratio, and but uh, there are many other, and this is logarithmic plot. So this one and this one, for example, is factor of something like 10 difference and so on. So, but the upper limit is very interesting. This is empirically there. Yeah. Nobody forced that them to be there. This, this is there. And I will try to, to, to argue my point of why there is upper limit. I, I think the highest TC heavy permits would probably lie further up also. You don't have them all there. Plutonium cobalt. Oh, plutonium cobalt, cobalt. if you try to plot it somewhere here. Yeah, it's, it's over the top. Yeah, it's in the same kind of family. Okay, so uh, 
Anyway, so around the time of 1992 or three or four, <coughs> there was, this was a period that the pseudo gap feature was recognized by nuclear magnetic resonance and the you know, conductivity of C axis and so on. And uh, so we thought that uh, probably uh, we can conceptually try to <laughs> model this behavior by as mapping to some fact you would expect if you have simple crossovers from Bose-Einstein condensation to BCS condensation. So the Bose-Einstein condensations, very important characteristic, or actually it's all Bose-Einstein condensation, but, but in, in the <laughs> sense that this left-hand side, what is important is that uh, we assume that pair is already formed in the normal state. So somewhere, uh, somewhere around this energy scale, pair is gradually formed. And so this normal state is a mixture of E and 2E. And uh, if your number density of, energy <laughs> of 2E boson becomes sufficient to make this as both condensation temperature, they would condense here. That is what you would expect for, for both bosons and dilute bosons essentially formed here. And the uh, TC will be increasing with number density as I will show you soon. But at some point, you will come to very dense metallic situation. And uh, so those PCS side or this dense side, you know, we are changing carrier density here. And uh, this dense side, the most important thing is that the normal state is just fermions. This is BCS, you know, BCS here, normal state is just E. And that means that the formation of the boson is occurring at this condensation temperature. Number density is already sufficient, and so you just have to have bosons formed by attractive interaction, and that's what's happening in the BCS kind of condensation. And probably there should be some kind of smooth connection for these two different stories. <laughs> and uh, also pairing temperature may be coming down. And actually, it, conceptually, it should merge at some point, and then it should be this pairing energy scale which is actually determining condensation energy scale because number density is very, very sufficient in this right hand side. So this is conceptual <laughs> thing of both Einstein to BCS, so local pair to normal metal-like situation. And uh, I thought that this might be able to, <laughs> at least this is kind of mappable to what's happening in the Kiplet <laughs> system. This is underdog, this is sort of, uh, this is optimally dog. But one, another important thing, where this is sort of crossing over, and again, I, I had a speculation in 1994, we even published this, that this is simple speculation, but that this left-hand side and right-hand side may be distinguished by the comparison of the number density kind of energy scale, this carrier density or Fermi temperature, that should be compared to Debye frequency or this boson <laughs> mediating boson energy scale. If you do that, that means that uh, right hand side is retarded like BCS situation and left hand side is non-retarded. And uh, I will try to show you that actually many of the new superconductors, this is approximately holding. I will show you with the number later. But uh, so interestingly, this crossover doesn't have to happen between with this uh, retarded versus non-retarded distinction, but it seems to be following that as well. And this is very nice if it's actually <laughs> simple and nice if it's that story. And so I will come back to that. But this is kind of conceptual, underlying conceptual thing. OK. Yeah. I'm talking about this thing. OK. So <laughs> let me just give you some small tutorial of Bose-Einstein condensation, because this is a kind of summer school. So uh, if you have a, a particle with momentum, you have kinetic energy with mass. And uh, uh, at the given high temperature, such and such particle has approximately kinetic energy of kdt. And uh, there is an uncertainty principle. And uh, uh, if you have such and such momentum, then uh, you would have some uncertainty <laughs> in real spread, space spread of the wave function. Uh, this is equivalent of defining so-called thermal wavelength. And at fat high temperature, what is happening is that uh, because kinetic energy is large, temperature is high, and so P is large, 
And so delta x is small. And so the spread of wave function is small. And so each particle is behaving like a classical particle and it's separated in a large distance like this. This is high temperature situation. But if you cool down to low temperature, at some stage, your thermal wavelength becomes comparable to the interparticle distance, so your nearest neighbor distance. And once this happens, what happens is that the wave function of one boson left hand side would start overlapping with another boson wave function of boson in the right hand side. And uh, bosons have genuine built in tendency to make wave functions coherent, I think. And this is the way for me to just simply understand how you can understand the <laughs> Bose Einstein condensation. If this happens, you can make a, at least local coherence of the wave function. <coughs> and uh, if there is no competing state, then you'll be able to make condensation. This simple argument will just give us very simple relationship between this distance, which is a uh, you know, distance cube is the uh, inverse of the density. And that will give you this very simple formula that Bose Einstein condensation temperature is a carrier density to the two third divided by the mass. If you put fermion language, then this uh, Bose Einstein condensation temperature is actually a quarter of Fermi temperature. You can see this is a Fermi temperature, and this is a Bose Einstein condensation temperature. You can check it very simply by <laughs> yourself soon. Anyway, now, <laughs> so as I mentioned, there seems to be, this is empirical, but very interesting upper limit of this uh, uh, T, actual TC, which is, again, even more reduced. You see, this so from TB, it's about a factor of four or five at least reduced. And why this is the case? And uh, because, so in that sense, that these superconductors are different from cold atoms. This is cold atoms figure that I got from physics today for a cold atom article. This is both Einstein to BCS crossover. But essentially, what cold atom is doing is that both condensations do is happening around the temperature of the ideal Bose gas temperature. In our superconductors, cube red, heavy ferments, and all these, the condensation temperature TC is factor of four or something lower from here. The difference, I think, <coughs> is because this cold atoms dilute gas, they do not have other states to compete with. But the superconductors, you have other ground states such as mo most notably magnetically ordered state and so on to compete with. And if you have competing state, then your TC is usually lowered because what, what we are talking about is a fair free energy difference between the two states. And uh, that will give you TC. And uh, <laughs> so I think it's the existence of this uh, parent magnetic state. And I will show you another way of viewing this soon. Anyway, so <laughs> another way of viewing things can be also promoted by this thinking. If you look at this uh, experimental result, it's a 2 one 4 system, you know, with this carrier density divided by the mass, your TC is about 30 Kelvin. But for 1, 2, 3, your TC is about 60 Kelvin. Why is they are different? That this at least means that the this NS over M star is not the only factor to determine TCs. There's something also, another factor, which is contributing to this story. And uh, very roughly speaking, some of you who have worked on superconduct uh, cuplets might know that 214 system is closer to magnetic order with small amount of perturbation or you know, inclusion of some things. You can easily make it ordering magnetically. But one, two, three system is somehow far away from competing state. So this means that uh, your closeness to the competing state might be another factor which would determine the ordering temperature. And the ultimate argument is that because of that, all these cuplets are close to anyway the magnetically ordered state. And that's why they are different from the, uh, from the cold atoms which have no, no competing state. OK, so I will try to give you another <laughs> angle to view this. And uh, this is a, a consideration of magnetic resonance mode as a possible 
counterpart of rotons in the superfluid herring. Okay, so you have seen this phase diagrams, I think, already various speakers showed you that the uh, <laughs> phase diagrams of these novel superconductors are very much looking alike with each other. This is ion arsenide, one, two, two. This is cupret, one, two, three. This is <laughs> buckyball. You have always parent antiferromagnetic state. You have superconducting state developing. This is heavy pheromones. It's often first order transition and so on. But uh, I would like to add one more thing to this. This is a phase diagram of superfluid helium. And the parent state of superfluid helium is solid, hexagonal closed packed solid helium. You have superfluid state, that, you know, the transition is first order. And this is very much, again, looking alike these newer superconductors. So I will try to find out what we can learn from our old knowledge of superfluid herium. <coughs> the uh, most prominent thing that is known for superfluid herium is the existence of this <laughs> excitation called rotons. This is the, uh, essentially phonon-like uh, energy versus momentum transfer. This is a phonon branch. But if you measure phonons in superfluid herium, what you would have is this uh, minimum called rotons. And uh, this was <laughs> discussed by many people. This is the phenomena which gave Randall Nobel Prize. Anyway, so this Rotten and, uh, and Richard Feynman famous and so on. <laughs> anyway, this Rotten is energy minimum, but uh, the momentum transfer of Rotten is related to this. This is a Bragg peak of hexagonal closed packed herium. Okay, so this is a, if herium would become solid, this branch comes down here and would become just a phonon. So this is a so-called soft phonon or soft mode. The uh, superfluid is not solid yet, but superfluid theorem is remembering that he could be very close to the solid. This is how he remembers that. Okay, so uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, if you just put the number of mass and, and number density of herium, you'd both condensation temperature of bare uh, or of a uh, gas of, you know, ideal gas of herium should be 3.2 Kelvin. But the real lambda point of herium is 2.2 Kelvin. So this is about 50 times, 50% 50 reduced. And I think, to my opinion, it is related to this existence of rotten minimum. This is a providing low energy excitable mode to destroy condensate. And that therefore, existence of this kind of thing would help lowering ordering temperature. And uh, so rotons a soft phonon mode related to solidification of herium. And solidification of herium is a competing state. So actually, this situation was, in some sense, already noticed by Randall. And uh, there are some earlier works or he <laughs> you know, things that he mentioned and also works better calculation by some other people. But my way of convincing that rotten minimum is related to lambda point or TC, <coughs> condensation temperature, is just simply going back to the experiment of neutron scattering performed at Brookhaven in the 1970s and plot the lambda point TC versus rotten minimum energy here. So this is uh, ambient pressure. Lambda point is 2.2 Kelvin. Applying pressure, your rotten minimum energy becomes lower. You are coming closer to the solid. And according to your TC is getting lower, lambda point is getting lower. At some stage, you have, <coughs> unfortunately, suddenly things become solid. So at the rather small pressure, you will get into, unfortunately, you will lose this situation. And the first order transition takes place due to the solidification of Harry. But at least, with this small region of pressure, we are seeing that these two parameters are nearly linearly correlated. So this is my way of convincing people that uh, <laughs> rotten energy is important. And uh, this is actually an example, a very interesting example, that's TC of the bosonic superfluid, three-dimensional superfluid herium, is determined by soft mode energy towards competing state. So this is 
the way that competing state tries to say that he is there. You know, super fluid, you don't see this competing state. But since you have a competing state, you have soft mode, and existence of your soft mode would lower the TC. <coughs> this is how closeness to the competing state would vary your TC. Now, of course, we would like to try to find out if there is something similar in the case of cuprets and other superconductors. So this is a pro uh, <laughs> argument I would like to make. There is a, some kind of this soft mode, especially magnetic soft mode, measured by neutron scattering, which is known as magnetic resonance mode, or 41 milli electron volt neutron resonance mode. And uh, that is at least <laughs> Everybody knows that it's a soft mode towards magnetic order. You know, that comes about the Q space where you have antiferromagnetic order. But very interestingly, so I made a plot. This is a roton plot. Okay, this, I, I, I moved this axis to the right hand side, but this is again lambda point temperature. But for plotting the similar thing for the uh, high TC and other superconductors, of course, we need to go to higher temperature. So I multiplied both axes horizontal and vertical axis with factor of 60. So this means that if you have same slope, the ratio between two parameters are similar. Already what you are seeing here is this famous resonance mode, which is nearly proportional to TC of various cuprate superconductors. They have somehow similar slope as compared to this rotten relationship. And uh, if you know cuprate story more, this resonance mode actually comes with some detailed dispersion. In fact, it's important for this story is the low energy, the, where you have the lowest energy excitable mode. You know, that's how thermal transition is determined. So <laughs> for the case of cuprate, that is coming with this uh, hourglass shape, the end of the hourglass shape, that energy is called spin gap energy. And it's somehow slightly lower than the real uh, center energy of the uh, resonance mode. But anyway, so if you plot cuprate spin gap energy, it becomes here and here, which is even more directly closer to the relationship with this uh, rotten. So just because of this ratio argument, you would at least come <laughs> be invited to the speculation that I'm trying to, to make. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but no, I, I made the slope, same slope being same as because, okay, okay this is Roton, so this is two mirrorboard, um, I'm sorry, two Kelvin, and uh, this is cuprates, here it's 120 Kelvin, so this is factor of 60. I keep the ratio same, so energy here is 60 mirrorboard, this is 41 mirrorboard. It was, you know, one mirrorboard is Roton energy. So, so this plot is made in the ratio. That's the most important. Th therefore, the same slope means the same, same ratio. Okay. Now, fortunately, this magnetic resonance mode has been found in other superconductors as well. And uh, due to this ion arsenide was discovered. This is a nice experiment from Oak Ridge people and so on that uh, reported history, this resonance here, and its intensity actually disappears above the superconducting TC. This is the same as roton <laughs> intensity disappears above superfluid transition. Okay, and its momentum space is here, and that is related to the antiferromagnetic order. So this is again the soft mode. And if we plot that in this uh, you know, higher energy kind of scale, you will have here again the ratio is and the heavy fermion numbers, heavy fermions also the same story. Stream covered in the fire. Resonance mode was discovered by Corinne. We are putting it here, but it with this uh, rotten axis because this is the rate say. And uh second but the silicon too is also magnetic order and uh, magnetic 
maintenance mode in the Terra compound and conductor. This was discovered by Sigmund Explorer, and uh, this is a point. So, but many of the new superconductors, there is a <laughs> nice corresponding DC resonance mode energy. That the resonance mode in is uh, not only but also charts of mode as well. Interestingly, six of them that here is not only spin channel but also in charge channel. And this is all the reason that it is really affecting the spin charges are very easy in the case of so expecting this this is essentially to situation. So exciting it's the same just <laughs> With anyway, so this is the, <laughs> the resonance mode versus TC. This is showing where the resonance mode is in the key space. Corresponding key vector of the character of computing speed. So I should be missing again. The good teacher. Superconducting difference equal run engine mode on the game one to one. This is there. To argue about this. Um, I'm confusing. This is a and go to No, I Yeah, yeah. So, this is So in the TC, it turns out that the small of your data appears broken by just, you know, this is the term that's up 